welcome to another exciting episode of The Energy That Surrounds Us. I'm your host, Michael, and I am joined tonight on this special time with a very cool guest who has some really cool experiences to share with us. And so without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our wonderful guest, Joshua Kuchin. Hi there. It's great to be here. Thank you for coming. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a nice um it's a nice way to to start my uh start my week more or less. I didn't have anything like this last night, so this is a good start to the week. Well, I'm glad we can be a great fun start. So for those who may not be familiar with your work as an author and everything. Could you give our audience a little bit of your background? I'd be happy to. Um, it's been a, a long and winding road <laughs> getting to this uh, place right here, sitting with you. Um, my, uh, I guess if you really look back on my career towards writing about this sort of thing, it started um, back when I was a kid. I was something of a, a monster kid. If there was a creature feature or anything like that, um, I was there for it. So, you know, the Ray Harryhausen movies and... Uh, anything by uh, you know uh, Stan Winston, <laughs> all those great creature designs and stuff. I was there for it, but um, I also had a uh, a sort of interest in in Bigfoot to begin with. Um, and uh, it was this sort of thing was never really frowned upon in my household. Um, you know, I know a lot of people grew up in households where you know we don't talk about ghosts or or you know UFOs or anything crazy like that. But we, you know, we weren't. Um, my parents weren't necessarily into these topics, but they didn't really have a, a strong opinion either way. Um, and of course, we you know we all sort of believed in ghosts because that's just just made sense to us. Um, years later, I found out that my dad um, had subscribed had subscribed to the BFRO newsletter, the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization. So maybe it runs in my blood a little bit. But so I would sort of you know dabble with this sort of subject matter from time to time, and you know my parents were always just happy that I was reading. Um, but it wasn't until I took a uh, desk job in 2012 that was an hour commute from home that I really jumped into these topics um, with both feet, I guess. Um, that was back in something of, uh, I would call it maybe the wild, wild west days of, of paranormal podcasting. I know that there's a lot more now by <laughs> orders of magnitude, but um, I feel like that was really sort of a golden era back then. Um and so that was naturally, I was like, well, you know, this is an interest that I've always had. Maybe I'll listen to some of these podcasts on my way to, to and from work. And uh, it really rekindled a lot of this stuff. And um, so I was really getting back into this sort of subject matter. And I distinctly remember my sister-in-law um, got me a gift card to Amazon. And I was like, I'm going to buy a Bigfoot book. And I read uh, J. Robert Alley's Raincoast Sasquatch. It's a wonderful book. And I uh, distinctly remember... Um, that there was a reference to one of the Alaskan tribes who said that in their culture, if you were to take food from a bequest, which is um, their, their version of, of Sasquatch, um, you'd be trapped with the bequest forever. Now, for whatever reason, um, over the years, I had remembered that a very similar um, prohibition uh, was discussed often in the fairy folklore of Western Europe. I've since come to learn that it's a very widespread, almost universal belief amongst, you know, a lot of indigenous cultures. But um, I was like, wow, that's just struck me as so unlikely that you'd have these two cultures from literally the opposite sides of the planet, right? That would have that same warning about accepting food um, from beings other than humans because in places like ireland or the british isles or scotland um it was said that if you accepted food from the fairies while in fairyland you would be doomed to stay trapped in fairyland forever so it was just so specific to me that i was like wow that's a really good idea for a book someone should write a book on that and i sort of sat around for a while and i was like oh i guess i guess it's me so um my first book a trojan feast came out in 2015 and um since then, uh, I've been fortunate and blessed enough to have gotten a lot of good reception from my other work, and it's turned into a career alongside with uh, with playing music. So um, in a lot of ways, li living the dream over here. And um, now here I am, uh, depending on how you count seven-ish books later, <laughs> it's kind of difficult because some of my projects get split in two because they get so long. But um, 
seven ish books later i've uh i've got a, a little library <laughs> that i've that i've written all to myself um and what my work tends to focus on is still very true to that initial impulse that i had to compare these things and it is that sort of folkloric comparison of belief about paranormal entities and i cast a very broad net when i say paranormal entities i do ufos and stuff like that as well um comparing those uh across time and across space you know across the world to illustrate how it seems that we are interacting with something that has some sort of that's sort of the, the core of my work that and i, I like to look at um, aspects of these phenomena where they get mentioned a lot maybe in passing maybe somebody will dedicate a paragraph to it but i stop and say i read that in like 10 other books and no one's really ever explored it so that's what my uh, that's what my body of work is focused on. So the first book was a frozen piece that was on that piece. I think it my second book is a good example of me taking one of those tiny details and exploring it. It's called uh, the Brimstone Deceit, and it's about looking at the smell of sulfur across all these different encounters. The third book was about supernatural child abductions. It's called Deep in the Night. Then I wrote uh, Where the Footprints Been, Volume One and Two, with my co-author and friend from the dinner, which is the strangest Bigfoot account fine um and then my latest non-fiction work is ecology of souls volume one and two which is looking at all paranormal phenomena to that. Um, and my latest book uh is uh, is my novel the multi-age of the guide it's just sort of as a palette cleanser because ecology of souls ended up being a massive project and i was like i need to take a step away <laughs> and try this from a different angle for a little while so that's sort of um where i am today in a nutshell so I find it interesting that you say like career in music. So did you, while you were doing music, did you ever be like in a concert and be like, did I just see what I think I saw? Did I? <laughs> oh, every gig. Every gig, really gig is like happen? <laughs> Every gig is like that. No. Um, so yeah, I, for the longest time I was on the, um, career musician path with an eye towards um, orchestral tuba playing. I'm a tuba player. Um, I don't double on anything else. Um, I, I like to say that I play trombone at the level of a very talented but unmotivated sophomore in high school. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, I was on that. I was on that road for a very long time. I ended up having some performance injuries that I've since recovered from, but that sort of knocked me off of that trajectory. So I that's how I ended up winding up with um two master's degrees um one in music and uh one in journalism because i was like okay well I'll do i'll do arts criticism or you know arts pr or something and that was my first position was um a uh an arts pr uh job um but since then i've i've again my my performance injuries have recovered and i um am uh first called jazz tuba player in the atlanta area so it's something that is honestly a lot more fulfilling than sitting in the back of an orchestra and counting rests all day. Um, but you know, musicians are, are a strange bunch. Um, and it's always interesting to go into these situations and, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm around my UFO and Bigfoot friends, they're always like, what's, what's up with the tuba? <laughs> and and uh, when I'm with my musician friends, they're all like, what's up with the UFO and Bigfoot thing. But, um, but, you know, a, a lot of musicians have had a lot of strange experiences. A lot of musicians um, are fans of Coast to Coast AM because it's usually the only thing that will keep them awake when driving back from the gig at <laughs> 2 in the morning. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the, the things that I always find so compelling about sort of the intersection of music and the paranormal, and, and you get this in, um, you know, commercial styles like jazz and, and, and rock and, uh, and stuff like that, funk, um, there is sort of a, a, a group mind that develops sometimes um, in really good performances if, if you've played with people for a long time. And, you know, I remember with uh, my first uh, band, which is a New Orleans style brass band, um, I had played with the drummer for at that point. Well, it felt a lot longer at the time, I guess, but, you know, probably around eight years. Um, and, uh, it was we had gotten to the point where you know it was me and him on every single show more or less and uh i, I could just look at him and without really saying what i was going to change the style to i'd change and we'd both just like lock in right on a on a on a dime um we'd change on a dime and uh 
I, I know that part of that is just playing with uh, with someone for a long time, but at the same time, it felt it it could feel it had the potential to, and sometimes did feel so uncanny and instant. That I was like, are, are we doing something here? Because you know, playing a brass instrument, um, I don't have the opportunity to to yell out what I'm going to do, especially in the right. seat that I occupy because I'm playing constantly. So there's that aspect, and there's also um, you know, I I would never ever in a million years. Um, claim that I am a great um, improvisational soloist. Um, I know my way around chord changes. Um, so that's more of what I do in that sort of on the fly music making. But I will say that um, in so sometimes when I have taken an improvisational solo and often when I'm reading chord changes, um, stuff just happens automatically. Um, and there are instances where I have gone back and listened to what I've done. And it's, been, it seemed so what I have done in those, in those fleeting moments has seemed so far beyond what I, uh, estimate my own capacity <laughs> for musicianship to be that I'm like, did this come from somewhere else? And, you know, the more you talk to people who are involved in those sort of, you know, improvisational styles, you'll find that that's a real, a real common theme, that there is this flow state that you sometimes can slip into. Um, some of us are better at it than others, but this flow state where everything becomes not only um, highly virtuosic, but also um, automatic in a way as well, um, where it just doesn't even feel like you're consciously making those decisions. So uh, that probably is a big part of why I've stuck around with music is not only the spontaneity in the sort of things that I do nowadays, but also uh, to get to tap into that feeling because it is a, a really special thing. And, you know, then there's also something that I think uh, doesn't get addressed enough. And it's the fact that, you know, a room, uh, a venue, what, what have you, um, can feel extremely different and um you know just depending on on where the crowd is at and, and it's sometimes you just walk into some of these crowds and you're like oh tonight's gonna be an absolute drag <laughs> because it's you can just feel it there's no energy in the room right and sometimes right. you'll walk into the room and you'll be like oh my goodness what is happening like this is something that we're gonna plug straight into and it's gonna be a great time so and, you know, I don't really know what that is. I, I, you know, I, I could sit here and speculate on things like, uh, you know, um, uh, mass hysteria and egregores and things like that. But uh, but I, there is a tangible difference that you cannot necessarily control, and it just depends on how much you're getting back from the audience. Yeah. So I'm curious, as you're talking about when you're playing in the flow and you go back and listen and you're like, is that really me playing? Have you ever tried to duplicate and be like, why, why can't I make it sound this way? Or, oh, well, I really can play this way. <laughs> well, you know, it's 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 so much of, that's one of the things that I've always found really interesting about, um, at least from like, you know, that sort of uh, classical Western tradition, um, what, you know, whether it's strings or woodwinds or percussion or, or, or brass, um, in my experience being around those groups of instrumentalists, um, so much of, of learning to play an instrument well is just getting out of your own way. You know, <laughs> it's just getting out of your own head and, and not trying to, um, you know, the time for evaluation comes afterwards. You listen to a recording, but, you know, classical musicians are very bad about um, evaluating on the fly. At least that's the way we all start out, right? Um, because we're trying to get better. And so we are, we're evaluating as we go and, and that, that can often get in our way. So that's part of it. Um, I, I, if I didn't have some of the commitments that I did, in, including children, um, I probably would go back and try to recreate those moments and, you know, spend time in the shed as a lot of us musicians refer to the practice room as, but, um, but no, I, I haven't really made much of an effort to do that. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because there are some things that you, that, you know, some of them I don't think can be recreated because especially if you're playing live music um, in a really exciting venue, um, you are, as, as I alluded to, you're really plugging into the crowd as much as you're um, doing something yourself. And, you know, there are these sort of vague, ill-defined concepts like... Uh, like the groove, right? <laughs> and like, if, if you try to, if you try to do that by yourself, you can groove by yourself, but like grooving with like a group of other people and falling into that sink um, is, is really, uh, is really where it's at in terms of having those moments. I would love to see some studies at some point 
of uh, whether or not musicians' um, heartbeats in a setting like that sync up. There probably has been some research done, but I would not be surprised at all if um, once you get a, a gr close group of friends who are making music together, um, if there isn't sort of a synchronization of you know everything from heartbeats to blood pressure and everything in between right. yeah yeah I, I was curious because my my line of thinking where i was going with it was maybe you like kind of stepped aside and a spirit came in and played and that's why you like no i mean i i am completely um sympathetic to that viewpoint um and uh it, it's it's just it's a lot like any creative endeavor in the fact that I was reading a, an interview with Ray Bradbury and it said you know towards the end of his life he was saying that he would just sort of in the wee hours of the morning go down to his study and pull one of his books off the shelf and read it and he'd just look at it and be like I have no idea where this came from <laughs> and uh, there really is a lot of that I mean you know I think it was um it was either Haydn or Handel, and I'm, all my old music professors are screaming at me right now, but one of them um, said that the only thing he ever um, really uh, wished for was a, a good melody to come to him, because, you know, everything else about the actual, like, creation of the form and the structure and, and the harmonization and whatnot was second nature, but that, that actual initial good melody was the thing that he felt like he really had no control over. It just kind of had to come to him, and and uh, it is like that, you know, the, the more you force these things, um, generally the worse the results are. Uh, so there was a time back when I was drinking where I would just, you know, sort of get trashed and <laughs> write music. And some of that stuff I still play today. And I'm like, that's pretty good. I have no idea where that came from. Uh, again, getting out of your own way. But uh, but in getting out of your own way, do you sort of um, invite something in? And that's some that's a story that's, you know, as old as time in terms of artists in general um, sort of being in contact with whatever this other thing is, you know, and I think that there is something to it. You look at these phenomena um, always seem to have a soft spot for, for artists. You know, the artists and musicians were the ones that the fairies always kidnapped. And uh, there is a loose correlation. I think you could make between creative types and uh, UFO experiencers today. So I think that it really does come right up against that, uh, that line between, the imagined world and the real world and how artists sort of bring that, that into, into being. And sometimes we do become vessels, I think. Yeah. And it'd be interesting because it's like being paranormal, you know, and a music lover. I mean, you could think trumpet. Who do you think? Duke Ellington, maybe coming through or, you know, guitarist, you know, a lot of, you know, famous guitarists, but you don't sit there and go, oh, man, this one tuba player <laughs> nailed it this century. And to bring him back would be. And so that's why I was like, you know, we don't think about them, but I'm sure they're out there. Well, you know, to go off on a weird tangent that your audience will probably find insanely boring. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have a real admiration uh, for the uh, tuba community. And it, it, it does exist, actually. You'd be surprised how deep that particular rabbit hole goes. Um but, uh, you know, back, you can, you hear these stories. I remember hearing these stories from several people that um, in the post-World War II era, there were guys who were landing, um, and I say guys because it was mostly guys who were auditioning for them. Although one of my teachers in my lineage was was a female tuba player who had an amazing career. Um, but, you know, there were folks who were landing orchestral tuba player jobs Um you know, because they knew their B flat scale, like that was the only requirement, like the scale that you learn in middle school after your first year was what was landing these people, um, jobs and orchestra positions. And, um, you know, nowadays those are so coveted. I mean, honestly, there is, you stand a better job. There are more positions as NBA players than there are, um, full time, salaried with benefits paying a, a good living wage orchestra positions in the united states like it's it's you know it's 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 a shockingly narrow pool that's drawn from and so it's just become highly competitive and if you look at the uh the tuba community in particular um the the distance that ha they've come in the past 80 years and the things that people are doing on the instrument it's just and and part of that is because um there's this sort of 
need for a lot of tuba players to prove themselves because they're the butt of jokes all the time. And, oh, you're not nimble and you can't do this and you can't play high and you can't, you know, double tongue and triple tongue. No, no it's, it's some, if you, if you look, there are some players that are doing absolutely phenomenal things out there and are also just being incredible musicians at the same time. Um, so yeah, um, it's, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting world. And, uh, and I sort of, I straddle both those lines, I guess. No, that's really admirable. And, you know, congratulations on the tuba, because I remember when I was, like you're saying, you know, sixth grade band, and they're like, what instrument did you want? Not the tuba, right? the tuba. I'd be like, there's no way I can carry that or hold yeah. that. Yeah. No, I, yeah. All day, so forget it. Well, I'm a big fella, um, and uh, my best friend was wanting to play trombone, and I was wanting to play trombone with him too, and my band director, selfishly knowing that he was short on tuba player, said, oh, no, you need to play tuba, and that's how I got stuck with it. And so it's you definitely have to find a way to make your own opportunities. Um, prior to the birth of my sons, um, several years back, I was doing a lot of teaching and teaching and writing, and, and now it's gotten to the point where I just I teach and I'm sorry, uh, I was doing teaching, writing, and gigging, and uh, once my sons were born, I dropped the teaching aspect, and I just write and, and gig now, um, which, you know, is, is partially a function of, of sticking around in the music scene long enough to get your name out there, but um, it's it's really a, a wonderful thing just to focus on that aspect of it, um, and it's refreshing, because here here's the thing that I've noticed about my involvement in the paranormal is that if, if this is like the only thing that you think about and the only thing that you do and you eat, sleep and breathe this stuff, um, it can drive you a little bit mad. I think <laughs> I've, I've seen this yeah. happen to a couple of people, um, who have really pursued this with, with their all. And it, 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 it often, not always, but it often doesn't end well. And, and so it's nice to, you know, whenever I get frustrated with writing or with, um, you know, some aspects of, of the paranormal community to be able to switch to something that's completely different and uses a completely different part of my brain and is with a completely different group of folks. Um, it really is sort of a pressure valve in that respect. And I really, really love it. Yeah. Well, not to switch subjects abruptly, but we've kind of touched on one. And so I'm going to kind of do a small, as you would say, segue to Another topic is you talk about fairy sightings, and I'm curious why just fairies and not the other fae, or is there a reason behind, or do you consider most of the fae as fairies? Yeah, so I kind of, sometimes people have, have talked to me or introduced me, and they're like, fairy expert Joshua Cutchin, and I'm like, no, trust me, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the fairy expert because I have some colleagues um, that I I really really admire, um, who really do get especially granular with the fairy lore because it is so region dependent that you can sort of, you know, um, for example, there was a, a film that came out uh, a year or two ago and it was featuring uh, red caps in Ireland, and I was I. I knew this fact in the back of my head, but it didn't bother me until um, one of my colleagues, Morgan Daimler, they pointed out uh, that uh, red caps are strictly an English fairy. So what are they doing in Ireland? I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I so so you can get like hyper hyper focused and hyper local and hyper granular with with what fairies are. I tend to use it in more of, of a broad brush. Um, again, I not inaccurately, but I try to sort of look at the fairy. The, the body of fairy folklore from from more of a ten thousand foot view, and then touch upon these individual things as needed. Um, but once you do that, you you start to see that there's a lot of crossover between all these different things. I mean, some some of it's really obvious, like elves and fairies and pixies and and goblins. They're all they all sort of fall under that fairy umbrella. Um, uh, but once you sort of start to look at these other bodies of, of folklore, you start to see that a lot of them uh, cross pollinate with the fairy stuff. Um, a good example of that would be something like mermaids. You know, there are some myths and legends associated with mermaids that are identical to some of the uh, folklore that surrounds, you know, fairies in general. And the same can be said for, you know, giants, which is completely, 
it's completely counterintuitive that you would associate giants with fairies, but a lot of them, you know, a, a lot of the, they have they share a lot of folklore, and then same thing can be said in some instances of dragons and uh, even you know something that I go into a bit in where the footprints end, um, even large wild men, you know, like uh, like uh, like Bigfoot. So, um, so I, I try to take a as as big a picture as I can when I look at it. And uh, the thing that has always really pulled me in that direction again i can't tell i can't tell you why that one bit of fairy folklore about not eating food in fairyland stuck with me i have no idea but for some reason it did and i have always been drawn to to this particular um paranormal phenomenon uh for a long time and i i suppose it's partially the fact that you know, when people are talking about something like like Bigfoot or like UFOs, they might say something like, well, of course, you know, it, the UFOs are possible. It's not like we're talking about unicorns or leprechauns. So it's it's yeah. always been interesting to me that like something that we as a culture um, have come to sort of ridicule and use as an example of something that doesn't exist um, is still seen to this day. And moreover, um, still has so much in common with a lot of other paranormal stuff. And part of that's because the term fairy was once used um, much in the same way that we would use paranormal or supernatural today, right? They'd see something and they'd say, oh, that's fairy, right? But um, the uh, the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of that fairy folklore, and again, I believe that there's something objective, there's an objective reality to paranormal phenomena in general. And I rarely run across a paranormal topic. I, I don't believe that, right? But so much of fairy folklore has gotten folded in to these other um, these other phenomena that we don't really think have anything to do with it. So I can, I can find aspects of fairy folklore in you know hollow earth conspiracies. I can find it all over the UFO stuff to the extent that I think that they're one and the same. Quite frankly, I can find a ton of it in the Bigfoot stuff. Um, and uh, you can find a ton of it in lake monster stuff as well. Um, there's a close association between fairies and lake monsters too. So that's um, what I find really attractive about the sort of body of fairy folklore. Um, and again, we're talking about something that's a worldwide phenomenon. Um, a lot of indigenous people around the world had, had a belief in little people. Um, what I find so attractive about the whole corpus of, of fairy folklore is, is the fact that it does have these ties to things that we think are new or interesting, or, you know, we'll say, I wonder why, you know, this phenomena does X, Y, Z. And it's like, well, if you look back to this older fairy folklore, it's, it's, it's been with us all along. So there's a shocking consistency that's revealed in fairy folklore that has remained through to the present day. So I'm curious with you looking at the fairy folklore and the way that you do, I always grew up in the back of my mind, kind of like you're saying, you know, where, you know, you heard something and it kind of sticks there is fairies can be your friend and can be, you know, helpful, but also tricksters and your worst nightmare if you cross them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's. That's one of the things that we've <clears throat> sort of swept under the rug as a modern culture, isn't it? We think that fairies are all sweetness and light all the time. And and very, I mean, some were, some of these fairy species, races, whatever you want to call them, those specific things that I was talking about, some of them were more um, benevolently disposed uh, to human beings and others. But again, speaking broadly and generally, um, they were, they they were not always great. <laughs> you know, they weren't always great to you. Um, it very much depended upon your relationship and the sort of level of deference that you showed to them and the sort of level of respect that you showed to them. Um, not only, you know, acting maliciously towards them or acting disrespectfully towards them, but also just accidental disrespect. I mean, there are stories of people who were blinded because they stumbled, you know, up against a fairy tree. <laughs> it's like this person didn't do anything wrong but they still suffer the consequences for it so yeah there is a malevolent streak which does tie in as you alluded to um to the tricksterish nature of uh, of the fairies and they could um you know if, if you respected them and you treated them right and maybe you had a uh, uh, cunning man or cunning woman or fairy doctor put in a good word for you um they would 
do great things for you. They would do the things that you read about in some of the fairy tales, like fixing all your shoes or, or tidying up your household or something like that. Um, but if you transgressed in any sort of way, um, intentionally or unintentionally, it was bad news. Um, blindness, illness, um, everything up in up until like bad luck and even death um could be attributed to this a, a great example of this is um if you go to ireland to this day you will still see some older homes that have these corners that are sort of lopped off you know where you can tell that the masonry has been repaired and it was once coming to a point but it's since you know been made flat and um <clears throat> In some cases, that is because uh, people just put up their homes and they didn't consult any of the magical practitioners in the area as to where the fairy paths were. And they would put up their house and then everybody in the house would start having bad luck. And, you know, a child would suffer from con for, from consumption for, you know, months at a time. And they'd be like, oh, maybe I should consult my, my, local, uh, my local sorcerer or sorceress. And... Um, that's when they discover that oh you actually accidentally built your home around over a over a fairy pathway and they amend that particular portion of the house hopefully it was something like a corner that was a relatively easy fix and their luck would change um and that too is kind of a good symbol of of how um despite us not taking it seriously fairy folklore remains with us to this very day and is as strong in some ways um, as it always has been. Not only the the UFO alien abduction phenomenon that we I mentioned in passing, but also just in pop culture. I mean, so many things that we get from uh, in fantasy and science fiction even um, are come from fairy folklore. And you could argue that even in our language, I mean, I'm sure there are other examples in languages other than English, but if you just look at English alone, that then the medical term stroke is a direct reference to the fairy stroke where, you know, the fairy would touch you and that you would, you know, have a, have a fit and become paralyzed. Um, the term, uh, the term cobalt um, is uh, derived from the mineral cobalt but that mineral was named for the kobolds and the knockers in the german mine so there are these little things that are sort of filtered their way down to us through time and it, it really influences and impacts a lot of the way that we um think about the world even though we don't always appreciate that presence that's still with us so i'm curious you touched on it a little bit with the fairy kind that like the for example, the gods, the ancient gods, say the Greek gods, Roman gods, their their story, they say they cease to exist once mankind no longer believes in them. Or you could say they left. They simply left. How does that work with fairy kind? Do they continue to exist even when people are like, they don't exist? Or do they, you know, suffer from that? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, every now and then you read a work of fiction and you're like, I think they're getting pretty close to what's actually going on. And what you just said put me in the mindset of Neil Gaiman's American Gods, where, you know, there are these, there are these um, deities that sort of um, thrive on, on how much they're believed. I would um, say that fairy folklore is exceptionally um, resilient and malleable. And what I mean by that specifically is that um, as early as Chaucer, you see references to uh, this exodus of the fairies. And they would describe these little wagons pulled by tiny ponies and the fairies were leaving. And the reasons for that were ascribed to any number of things, everything from, you know, um, the advances in technology to, you know, humans encroaching into the wilderness to the church and but, you know, the, the fairy exodus never stopped. Like, you can find contemporary stories still describing the fairies leaving. Um, as, as the author Patrick Harper once said, leaving, 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 but never, but never gone. Similarly, the aliens are coming, 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 but never here, right? That was another observation that Patrick Harper made. But, um, but the fairy folklore does a good job of traveling with cultures. Um, uh, it was once thought that... Uh, fairy folklore did not make the transatlantic voyage with early settlers outside of New England. That's not just simply not true. Um, you can find 
Tommy Knocker legends from Cornwall that made their way all the way to Montana. Um, and similarly, a lot of those beliefs came here and they syncretized with a lot of indigenous North American beliefs that went, that in a lot of ways sound like they're describing the exact same thing. You know, that's especially prominent with Cherokee fairy beliefs in, in my part of the country. Um, but uh, I would argue that that what fairy folklore does is that it, it also diffuses really well and it, it does get picked up by these other phenomena or they're the same phenomena. So um, a good example that I like to use of this is that there is a line of thought amongst some Bigfoot researchers that Bigfoot likes to steal into stables at night and braid horses' manes. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, right? It's sounds a little silly. Um, I have read an account from a, a Russian researcher who says that something happens similar. He actually witnessed something happening similar with a, a Russian version of Bigfoot, the Almasti. But what's interesting about that idea of, of breaking into a stable and braiding horses' manes at night, which let's face it, is probably just tangled manes from the night before, from the day before, is that um, if you were to take that exact same phenomenon and transplant it to, you know, Devon, in 1852 or something um it would be blamed on the fairies and indeed to this day in some of the parts that fairy folklore was best imported to the new world um places like nova scotia that's still a, a, a something that people will blame on fairies this these sort of horses manes being braided now you get out to montana where fewer people care about fairies um there isn't that sort of rich tradition still there and people start to blame it on things like bigfoot so you have these individual aspects of fairy folklore that sort of get scattered into these other paranormal domains i would argue strongly that the ufo phenomenon um picked up a lot of these attributes um more strongly than anywhere else i mean i don't want to go too far down this particular rabbit hole because it's uh <laughs> it, it, it's deep right um but there are a lot of examples that you can use. Um, some of them are very superficial, like, you know, little green men being a derivative of little men in green um, through to things like, uh, well, through to things like, you know, um, a lot of these reports that you hear from alien abductees are these smaller worker drones and this taller supervising gray alien, right? And that sounds like an exact um, reworking of uh, the smaller fairies and, and fairy royalty, fairy queens and fairy kings that stood the size of your average human being while the other fairies were shorter. Even something like um, alien implants, you know, which seems very technological, very futuristic, um, has a direct analog in fairy folklore. I was astonished to discover this, but... Um, you know, amongst alien abductees who have had these objects removed from various parts of their body, they are generally revealed to be um, some sort of foreign object that gets under the skin and has calcium that accretes around it and and whatnot. But, um, you know, and they say, oh, no, it's just it's so advanced it doesn't appear to be technology. But if, if you look back into the fairy folklore, um, the words blast, blister, and blustery all share the same Germanic root because... If you offended the fairies through one of those many ways that we discussed just a moment ago, uh, they might hit you with a big gust of blustery wind um, in something that was called the fairy blast. And the fairy blast would leave a blister. And once it was opened up, it was filled with all sorts of things. Everything from teeth to bones to sticks and leaves to... Uh, to bits of string and and just all sorts of just just junk, right? So to me, that sounds like a direct um, reinvention of this older idea of the fairy blast, the lesion filled with trash um, in the modern alien abduction scenario. And again, that's just one of about probably thirty examples uh, that I've I've collected over the years. And it's gotten to the point where I think that if you see something in in the uh, modern UFO. Uh, literature you can find an analog in the fairy folklore and if you see something in fairy folklore you can find an analog in the modern ufo literature i don't know if that means that yesterday's fairies um were actually aliens i don't know if that means that today's aliens are actually fairies i tend to suspect that these are both two these are both two culture dependent ways of describing the same phenomenon that human beings just don't have the proper language to express in objective terms right and it's interesting how you point out like they're still around in today's nomenclature or however you say that word like an example is you know i was raised where if i set my keys say on the counter 
and then they're not there, yep. the fairies took your keys. Yep. You asked them to give them back. And so they're still, and you know, it's almost like you're saying, you know, as much as we try to erase them, they're always going to be there because it's yeah. always somehow in our language or something we're taught. Oh, a, a hundred. Yeah, you just sort of you just sort of swim in this cultural soup, and you don't realize how many of these things you pick up. But there are things like that, and I, I love that example because that's very consistent with what you would hear about this sort of tricksterish behavior of these things. Um, and you know, it, it gets borrowed in science fiction all the time. There was a Netflix series um, a little while back. Uh, spoilers for I believe it was called Katla. Um, it was an Icelandic series, and. Uh, there were these doubles of people that were showing up all the time. And that's really derivative of the changeling folklore that you hear in, in these older fairy stories. And, uh, the, but the reason behind this, because, you know, we're in, you know, the, the, uh, 2020s or whatever, um, is, was, was, a, was a, an extraterrestrial meteorite had landed and that was causing people to duplicate. And I'm like, okay, well, you're just taking fairy lore and you're just grafting it onto something that sounds extraterrestrial to make it more, more palatable, more believable to your audience. But it really is the same idea, just getting reworked. So it's almost like, um, appropriately, appropriately enough, because sometimes they were said to live underground, it's almost like fairy folklore sort of went underground and uh, sort of um, injected itself into all these other um, more modern uh, beliefs that are are more, you know, believable to to folks in the 21st century. I'm curious your thoughts on something I've kind of toyed with with, you know, because mankind evolves, aliens, you know, evolved from where they started from to where they are today, and our beliefs, you know, it could be the other way around. They're evolving the same way we are, but. I'm wondering because fairies were around and then as fairies started to get quieter, like you're saying, going underground, we started hearing the term elemental, mm. that the elementals were around. So I'm curious, did the fairies evolve into elementals? Well, it's, I guess that sort of depends on, on your perspective on what these things in all of the paranormal are. So if you believe, and I suspect this myself, that our cultural and societal expectations of what this phenomena is and what we call it, if, if you suspect that there's a dialogue between the supernatural and what we expect it to be, then I think that there is an evolution there. You know, um, I think that there's sort of a, a, a two-way exchange of between expectation and what it is. I, I will say that this, is, this question is also sort of tied up in what fairies supposedly were to begin with, which um, seems like it should be an easy thing to pin down, but it's still um, much debated amongst fairy scholars. Um, there uh, is the longstanding belief that the fairies were sort of demoted pagan deities or lesser gods and goddesses of the landscape that sort of um, fell from grace as Christianity arose and they became fairies as opposed to things to be worshiped. Um, there is this idea that they are nature spirits. Um, that idea uh, is tied into these older Greco-Roman ideas of a spirit of place called um, uh, genus loci. But um, at the same time, it's also tied up in the work of, uh, I believe it was a 16th century uh, alchemist by the name of Paracelsus, who divided... Uh, spirits into these elemental categories of you know the salamanders were for fire and oh the gnomes were for earth and i think there were four or five sylphs were for uh, the ether for the air um and those ideas sort of have their own um trajectory which i'll, I'll get to in a moment but of, of the other ex of the other explanations for what the fairies were slash are is that they were perhaps um <laughs> angels that were too good for hell and too bad for heaven, or they were angels that were uh, outside of uh, hell or the early gate during the great battle between heaven and hell, and they first fell to the ground, and that's where they stayed, and wherever they fell. Um, obviously, you know, Christianity had, uh, had a certain amount of faith though in there. Um, there's also a strong case to be made, which is a lot of what uh, my book, Ecology of Souls, deal with. A strong case to be made that um, theories were a way of conceptualizing what you can get. Um, in fact, prior to uh, the late 19th century, a lot of people said that either you, know, you died in 
became a fairy or that you know, sometimes sometimes to become a fairy or that, that fairies are somehow involved in the death process. And sure enough, especially in Western Europe, again, I can make this elsewhere in the world, but especially in Western Europe, there are all these stories of people who go to fairyland and they end up being dead neighbors and dead relatives uh, there in fairyland. So there is some sort of connection to death there. But going back to this idea of elemental, um, uh, Paracelsus comes up with these ideas of, of elementals. They get adopted by folks like Neil Steiner and they get brought into this um, late 19th century uh, mystical movement known as Theosophy. I'm not sure if people have looked into Theosophy before, but Theosophy um, colors so much of what we understand and think about the paranormal nowadays. Um, and that's when this idea of history, strictly as elemental, is really um, I, I tend to adopt an idea. Um, that was put forth by the uh, former professor at the School of Ball by the name of Claude Lecouteau. He writes an excellent book on, on these topics. And uh, Claude Lecouteau outlined the mechanism that has been discussed by other scholars, wherein a person uh, in, you know, the, in a pre Christian era, a person uh, who was revered by a community, by a tribe, what have you, um, perhaps a chieftain or a warrior or a chief or something along those lines, um, would be buried in a certain place. And over time, um, that place would become sacred. And people would go there and they'd make offerings to the person who was buried there. But also over time, that memory of exactly who that person was as a living human being in the space. And the actual memory of that person sort of evolved into being a spirit of place, which is very much tied into the idea of a nature spirit or an elemental. And, you know, we've actually been fortunate enough to, to see some of this sort of phenomenon unfold in, in real time. There are clear indications that some of these ghosts and humans and even fairies that inhabit or occupy crossroads in places like Western Europe um, were criminals that were executed for crossroads and fairies that you know, sort of over the years evolved into this particular spirit. There's also a precedent for it in indigenous um, Buryat Thomas that actually incurred uh, buried in one place, and then uh, later they're uh, dug back up and buried in another place for the specific purpose of becoming sort of a spirit of that particular area for that particular reason. So there does seem to be like this evolution that you alluded to, um, wherein even something like a human being can be buried, and over time belief and memory um, sort of blur what they were, and uh, and they become something like a fairy or a spirit of place. And again, in my worldview of the paranormal, um, that means that, yes, that's exactly what happened. Like, <laughs> it, it's not once a ghost, always a ghost. Like, your, your identity as a spirit is, is sort of dependent upon what people are expecting you, what people are expecting to be. So you could become a Very long winded way of answering your question, but um, the, the idea of fairy origins of itself is, is super complex. <laughs> No, and I, I'm grateful for the answer because it really makes it clear and kind of ties it together to where it's like, yeah, I, I understand more what they were saying and looking at instead of just going, yeah, we went from A to B. Okay. No explanation, but sure, why not? Yeah, don't, don't like, let any don't let anyone tell you that fairies are just this or just that because the answer is super complex. And even some of my colleagues that I referred to, whom I admire, they'll say the exact same thing. None of us know what the, none of us know what fairies started out as. You know, it's it's this never ending question that we're still uh, wrestling with to this day. Yeah. Yeah, and the reason too why I was thinking it so to kind of. Ex- clarify my line of thinking where I was thinking this is elementals are protectors spirits. Fairies mm-hmm. were protectorates of fairy land, nature. And so it's like in my mind, I'm like, well, you have one protector. You evolve it. So what's it going to do? It's going to protect something else. Well, what's a bigger protector than a small fairy? an elemental and when you see images of them they look similar in yeah. some instances no i i completely agree and, and i'm super sympathetic like part of me really wants them to be um part of part of me wants them to be nature spirits and, and elementals um because i i love that idea of it being an intelligence that never was even once human 
but you know it's such a it's such a complex question um right. but 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 you're right like the, uh, many of them do serve they, they are very closely tied to place um you know obviously there are some landmarks that are named fairy this and fairy that or the pixies den or something like that um but they are very much tied to landmarks ancient monuments um mountains caves streams um glens stuff like that and that does really put you in the mindset of them being sort of protectors of that space and and it's it's true like if, if you misbehave in those spaces you're, you're going to pay for it probably All right and one of the things that's kind of funny too is um i i'm kind of a fan of the hallmark movies and they did a movie where this uh, they were going to develop this golf course that happened to be on fairy land and they couldn't get it. The plans approved until like you were saying, the local sorcerer, so to speak, approved the plan. And it, it was like great how they brought that. You <laughs> I know, love that. It was like, yeah, you know, we could easily have the story, but it's great to find this one little thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this area unique compared to everywhere else i need to check that out i haven't seen it i would love to it's it's really interesting like to this day it doesn't happen as much as it did in ireland but um you know i can run across references to this throughout the 70s and 80s and it, there's still a good deal of this but um construction projects would be halted or, or diverted because you know it would in, it would involve um you know, knocking down a, a fairy tree or something like, and there are, there are stories. Um, again, the ones that I'm most familiar with come from like the seventies of, uh, you know, construction workers and contractors just folding their arms and refusing to go any further because they don't want to risk it. And, you know, of course, when somebody decides to risk it, they, there's a peculiar accident with an excavator or something like that. Yeah, there's you a know. downfall yep, somewhere. Yep. 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 <laughs> um, but, but that does speak to the fact, um, you know, I, I had the good fortune of going to Ireland in 2017 and, uh, you know, walking into a pub and talking to, you know, a 20 something about fairies and, you know, the topic comes up and it's, and, you know, one of the, one of the things that I heard often was, you know, well, I, of course I don't believe in fairies, but I'm, I'm scared of them. <laughs> like, you know, it's sort of yeah. like, you know, I don't want to, don't want to go there. Don't want to, don't want to test and try it. So Again, it's just it's just fascinating to me that this is still a, a living body of, of folklore that we just treat yeah. so flippantly, you know. But it is humorous how I've heard that too, where they'll they'll be adamant fairies don't exist, and then you go, "Oh, so you're gonna do this? No, I don't want to cross them." Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, what are you crossing? If you don't believe them, what are you crossing? Yeah, I mean, you sort of run into people like this in America who are like, ghosts don't exist. And then the moment you try to get them to go with you into the haunted house, they, they suddenly get real skittish. Yeah. So I'm curious, because we have like less than six minutes left, and I don't know if you can go longer or not. But one of the things I wanted to ask is with around the cryptids. And we talked about mermaids. And as we were talking about them and you mentioned them, my first thought popped in my head and goes, is a mermaid a cryptid or a fairy? And even further is I've heard of a place in Washington where the government, Department of Energy, made cryptids. They actually admitted to crossbreeding animals with humans to create super animals and so could a mermaid be an after effect of that well as to your first question um that's a that it's it, it's a it's a great thing to ask because depending upon whom you ask you'll get different answers um there are cryptozoologists who have done extensive work on mermaids. Uh, Lauren Coleman, sort of the godfather of, Christ of uh, Christianity, <laughs> the godfather of cryptozoology, um, <laughs> just re recently released a book on mermaids, taking a look at sightings. And, and they're, they come from everywhere, and they are still seen today. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it all depends on one's perspective. Um, I, I find myself in the topic of something like mermaids from a flesh and blood perspective. I find myself in the same position that I found myself when I embarked on writing where the footprints end with Bigfoot. Um, you know, I, I, I think we should have a body 
of, of, of these things if they existed in that sort of flesh and blood way, you know. At the same time, I talk to these people who will tell me things. You know, I one example that I love to use is that I spoke uh, confidentially with someone who was um, didn't really want to uh, share their experience in terms of, you know, putting their name on it, right? But a very well-balanced individual from all appearances who saw a cat person step across the road. So you've got, at some point, you've got to, like, you've got to reconcile the fact that we don't have more bulletproof physical evidence and yet there are honest decent people who see these things right so you've got to sort of try to make those things play together and reconcile them so i think i would think i would i know that the ocean is vast and deep and it's less explored than the moon i know all those stats but i i would think that we would have a little bit more evidence of a flesh and blood mermaid so in that sense i i sort of lean towards them being something more like fairies something that is you know you can call it spirit you can call it interdimensional whatever you want to call it and that's sort of the direction that I lean in, lean into, and that's similarly for those reasons. I I I don't really know what to do with some of these stories of of government experiments creating hybrids. Um, you know, uh, my my inner twelve year old really loves that idea that there's something out there that like is is roaming around, and we can you know, if you know, if if in sort of a a late. Uh, Saturday matinee movie style. We can get the community together and we can defend ourselves. You know, I, I think that's a really fun idea. Um, but I just, I just don't know. And, and, and in my time with, uh, in my time spent around the UFO topic, um, I just see so much deception and um, disinformation and, uh, and reading between the lines with a lot of these stories about the government that I just don't know what to make of it. So who knows? I mean, I'm not going to say that that's not possible and that's not the case. It's not the direction that I would go with it, but, um, you know, there are, these stories don't go away, right. Of these, uh, right. chimeras and these hybridizations. So, you know, I know some people have claimed that that's what's going on with the dog man phenomenon as well. Um, right. so, I, I, I like to tell people I have, you know, a lot of us have two baskets in our head, right? One says true and one says false. My true and false baskets are really small. And there's a gigantic basket in the middle that says interesting if true. And a lot of stuff <laughs> goes in there. So that's kind of where I sit with that. Right. And to clarify, the guest that I had on my show that was talking about the George, no, not George, the Gorge area in Washington where all this happened was during World War II when they were trying to protect the uranium, I believe, deposits in that area from spies. And they were like, well, we can't use dolphins because dolphins can't get that far in. So I love that, though. That's so cool. They said there was an article where the Department of Energy was in charge of it and said, hey, we were making a stronger, better crocodile. So if you come across it, could you let us know? Is it kind of <laughs> oh, that's not terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right, though. And, and here's the other thing that I think is important to remember, as much as I like to, as much as I step away from stories like that, um, I, I think that there are things going on that we have no idea about. And... Um, I think some of the stuff that we think isn't true is, and some of the stuff that we think is true isn't, you know? Um, so uh, I, I, so who knows? I love that story though, because I, I've always loved those stories about, you know, dolphins being used in espionage and stuff like that. So the idea that you get a super crocodile or even a mermaid um, to, to help out with that is super cool. And I even said to him, cause like he, he said it in passing and I was like, wait, 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 yeah, go back, go back. back up yeah, a yeah, second. You mean yeah. the government actually admitted something? And he goes, yeah, they actually did. I was like, exactly. that was the shocking part. It was like, well, wait. <laughs> and, and let's, and let's be clear. Like if this is possible, they would totally do it. Right. Or, the, or they oh, are, yeah. or they are totally doing it. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if, if like it's the only thing that's holding them back from doing something like that is, is logistics. Like, so I have no doubt that people are continuing to work at something like that. If it hasn't already right. happened. Yeah. And the reason I picked the mermaid as the, for the question is there's been so much folklore around them of like, you know, I know this is not reality, but the Peter Pan version where, you know, they were the, hey, Peter, the happy-go-lucky just laying around. 
And then there's the Pirates of the Caribbean mermaids that are like, will suck your soul and steal you. And you know, closer, and, closer, yeah. Then there's uh, Fantasy Island, the new one. I don't know if you saw that one, but Elena Rourke runs it, and she says we have a deal with the mermaids where they use their magic to keep our island hidden, and people can have their experiences but we don't fight them but we don't also allow them to take our people but they'll try to steal people and steal their lives and mm -hmm. so it's like we have all these different views of what is a mermaid oh it's yeah, a, yeah it's a fairy because that's the same thing fairies we cannot define it, it it all gets sanitized, right? Like all the all the fairy stuff gets sanitized. Um, you know, dragons got sanitized. I mean, if you look back to you know medieval texts and sort of the way that people were conceptualizing dragons, like dragons and Satan were like synonymous. You know, it's it's kind of one and the same. Like dragons were very rarely ever benevolent things. Um, so. Uh, yeah, and, and, and mermaids are a classic example of that, going all the way back to, you know, from when they were they were sirens and, you know, the Greek myths and whatnot. Um, they were a, a, a peril. Um, they weren't something that, uh, that you could buddy up with. <laughs> right. So yeah, the Peter Pan, the Peter Pan version, although, you know, it's interesting. I, I, uh, my sons are really love the, the Disney animated Peter Pan and, um, Rewatching that with a folklorist's eyes, I have not read the the Barry book, so um, I, I'll have to defer. I, I realize that Disney might have changed some stuff, but rewatching that with a folklorist's eyes, it's interesting because there there's some there's some odd stuff to be said about um, about the whole thing as a metaphor for for death. You know, <laughs> these children yeah. who are who are taken away by Peter Pan, and there is a passage in. <laughs> in Barry's Peter Pan book that I did read um, this particular passage that says that um, Wendy's mother recalled stories of Peter Pan taking children who had died to, to, to never, never land. And it, once you have that in your head, you're like, Oh, this sort of starts to look like that. Like, you know, Captain Hook is, is not so much afraid as the crocodile as he's afraid of time catching up with him, you know, <laughs> you know? Uh, so there's some stuff in there that, that really does, um, there's some depth in there that I hadn't appreciated before I got interested in all this stuff. Well, and it's interesting too, talking about the Peter Pan version is if you remember when Wendy lands by them and they're all around her, what's the one thing they do? They're like grabbing on her and they're wanting to pull her down. And they said, you know, let's drown her. Let's see if she's That's right. Yep. There's, <laughs> yeah, there is an illusion. Yeah. Um, so one of the other things that I released last year, um, was a collection of essays that I was the editor on, and I also contributed one essay, but it was on fairies and film. And it was sort of looking at what we've talked about a bit about tonight, um, this idea of how we don't really appreciate how much fairy folklore is in all of our lives. And so just looking at, you know, movies, you can see there are these films that don't ever really mention fairies where fairy folklore gets um, gets sort of pushed into it or ends up ends up in there. Um, so some of the top, some of the films, you know, the, the original Dune is talked about in one essay. Um, Rocky Horror Picture Show is talked about in one essay. Um, a good friend of mine wrote um, an essay on uh, fairy folklore in this uh, Japanese horror film called Maribito. Um, but yeah, it's it's it really is all over the place. And in one of the essays by someone else whom I admire greatly, Dr. Simon Young, um, somebody who I would call a fairy expert, um, talks about sort of rescuing this idea that um, Disney fairies are uh, are bad, you know, because a lot of us who are interested in fairy folklore, we sort of, Disney's the first example that we point to saying, that's not what fairies were actually like. But um, there's an argument to be made that there are some aspects of fairy folklore that did, that were accurate in some of those classic animated films. And yeah. that's one of the specific examples that he uses where, where the mermaids want to, want to drown <laughs> Wendy. It's like, yep, yep. That's, that's spot well, on. And also Tinkerbell, what did she want to do? She wanted the Lost Boys to shoot her down. Yep. Yep. And kill Wendy. <laughs> because, and she was motivated by um, her affections towards Peter Pan, which is, you know, yeah. again, this, this sort of um, something you see in a lot of these fairy stories going way back, the idea of, of fairies um, 
wanting to be intimate with human beings as well. And assuming that Peter was once a human being at some point, as one of the older Barry stories talks about um, Peter sort of being a, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the soul of a child who was sort of lost. <clears throat> um, so he started out as human in, in that capacity. So, yeah. I think um, the movie Hook talks about that because it's like he has that memory of being the child in the... Mm-hmm. That's right. I hadn't I haven't seen and, Hook in forever. I should go back and watch it. But um with the new movie Dune Part Two out, uh when you mentioned Dune uh, attached with fairies, my thought was, are we talking about the Fremen? Or <laughs> how do fairies come into Dune? Yeah, well this wasn't my uh, this wasn't my essay. That's, that's so I can't recall all the aspects of it off the top of my head, but that was part of the, the thrust was that the, the Fremen um, residing underground um, could be conceptualized as that. Um, and if you look at the Lynch version, um, where they have, if I if my memory serves, they have these like sort of ray guns. There was a comparison to be made that uh, that um, that there were uh, that was similar to like you know the invisible elf shot and stuff. Um, and you know comparisons to the spice and sort of the the magical powers of the fairies. Um, it was an interesting perspective. Yeah, it was an interesting perspective. Um, you know, and now that I think about it, they could ride the worm, and so yeah. So there's sort of that um, nature, nature, um, a close relationship with nature that, that we were yeah. talking about earlier too. Yeah, they've they've tamed the untamable on Arrakis. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've run a little bit over, and I know you have two twins, so I'm sure they're either asleep or wanting attention so before i let you go where can people find your books and you joshua kutchen.com j-o-s-h-u-a-c-u-t-c-h-i-n.com i uh try to keep everything there updated as far as uh, appearances and news about me um and depending on you know if i'm working on something new at the time it might be a little bit of time between updates but uh, i always try to keep everybody uh, aware of when I have a new book coming out or an appearance to interact with me. So um, all my interviews go up there as well. And I have uh, some of my books, not all of them, but some of my books. Um, you can reach out to me directly and uh, I can uh, send an autographed copy. We'll discuss that. So, Okay. And you mentioned having your interviews on there. Would you like me to send you a copy of the interview? Yeah, please do. Please do. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. I will. And before... We go. One thing with this being season two that I've started messing with and trying out is is there a like a golden nugget of information from your journey that you'd like to share with people? My bit of advice would be to, um, well, number one, I would quote John Keel <clears throat> and uh, say belief is the enemy when it comes to these topics. Like, never let yourself get too hardened in, in, in being too sure about what these things are or aren't. But the other thing that I would emphasize is that um, I think we should all take some time to reevaluate how well we actually have defined the boundary between physical and non-physical. And what I mean by that is... Uh, I, when I wrote Where the Footprints End with my co-author, uh, Timothy Renner, one of the sort of bits of pushback that I would hear um, from time to time, because the basic thrust of the those two books is that Bigfoot is not a giant ape, right? And one of the things that, one of the um, counterpoints that people would say would be things like, well, ghosts don't leave footprints. And I'm like, if you read your parapsychology... <laughs> If you go back and look, that was like the Victorian method for ghost hunting, right? Is to put talcum powder on the floor and wait for right. footprints. And and ghosts slam doors and ghosts move objects. So um, similarly, you know, psi phenomena, if it exists, which I think it's been proven in the laboratory um, by a lot of people, it's 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 the research is extremely good on that effect. Um, psi phenomena is in your head, but it interacts with this reality that we all share. So. I think that goes to show us that we don't really quite understand this internal external separation, this physical psychic, physical, non-physical separation. So I would encourage people to entertain the idea that that is less of a well-defined boundary um, than we think it is. And once you sort of realize that 
you can overlay that on a, onto a lot of uh, paranormal phenomena, UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, fairies, any of this stuff. And I don't know if it helps to make sense in the in the in the in the uh, in the uh, in the way that like you know about it better and you know something about it. It's not what I'm saying, but it allows you to sort of reconcile some of the things that are so um, confusing. I think about a lot of these phenomena. So to just sort of entertain that possibility that we don't really have a good grasp on what it means to be the difference between something you think about saying and something you say, right? Or like a movie that you think about making and a movie that you've made, you know, everything starts as a thought and then it gets brought into the physical world. And I wonder if that's not what we're dealing with sometimes with these topics. You know, that's beautifully said. And that's a, uh, yeah, you actually got me thinking about that now going, you know, you know, how much of that is true? You know, how much is thought being brought in and what are we creating and everything? And it's like, wow. Some food for thought. <laughs> yes. And so with that, I'm going to say wherever you are in the world, good night, good day. Blessings to you, Joshua, for coming on. And we hope that you'll come on again. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for everyone that's watching, thank you to the chat room and those of you watching. So wherever you are in the world, please make it a blessed day. Fill it with love and joy. Good night, everyone.